Welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. Tu B'Shvat is a Jewish holiday occurring on the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Shvat. It is also called Rosh Hashanah Le'ilanot, literally New Year of the Trees. In contemporary Israel, the day is celebrated as an ecological awareness day and trees are planted in celebration. Today, we chat with author Rebetzin Chana Bracha Siegelbaum about the seven fruits of the land of Israel. So Tu B'Shvat literally means the 15th of the Jewish month, Shvat. And each of the 12 months correspond to another, another kind of a sense. According to Kabbalah, eating is the sense of Shvat. So eating uh, is actually a sense in Kabbalah. And so the whole month of Shvat, we're working on more conscious, mindful eating. And we know we all have problems with that especially women, I think. And I think it goes back to all the way from eating from the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, that Chava, that Eve, was the woman that began that process. And so we women, we have this challenge. And so on Tu Bishvat, which is the middle of the month, the middle of the month always has the greatest energy of the month. That's when it's full moon. That's the time where we have the opportunity to really rectify eating. And so what we do in my Midrasha, in my seminary for women, is not really something that you have to do in Judaism, and it's something more that's been rediscovered in the later years. So it's quite recent. The Seder to Bishwat, similar to the Seder of Pesach, that we have four cups, just like in Pesach, and uh, what we do is we, we, we eat the special fruits of the land of Israel, and there's different categories of fruits. There's those without any, there's those that's completely edible, like figs, that you can eat everything of them. And there's those who have a hard pit, like prunes or um, apricots. And then there's those who have a hard shell, like nuts and pomegranate. So these are different categories of fruit, and it corresponds to the different sequence. There's Four, there's three categories, but there's four sequences, four cups of wine, just like in Pesach. So the first cup, we use the seven special fruits of the land of Israel. So the seven fruits of the land of Israel, first of all, they're fruits that grow here naturally, and they can survive without any additional irrigation. They're also fruits that have special both spiritual, mystical, and also medicinal properties. That's the subtitle of my book, The Seven Fruits of the Land of Israel, with their mystical and medicinal qualities. So these fruits are very special. They correspond to the mystical properties of how God manifests in this world. And he manifests in, diff in different kinds of light, like if you imagine wearing different colored glasses. It's all one light of God, but what the way it filters down into the world, it filters down in different ways. So each of these seven fruits filters down one of the seven, what we call sfirot, which is emanations of God, divine emanations. So wheat corresponds to what's in Hebrew called chesed, which is kindness. That's one way that God manifests in the world. Barley corresponds to, that's the second fruit, corresponds to gvura, which is a hard to translate to English. You would say power, strength, or severity. This is the ability to hold back and say no to that extra piece of chocolate. That's gvura, you need some of that. Discipline, it's two. Then grapes correspond to tiferet, which means beauty and harmony. And grapes always come in clusters. They all, you don't have just one grape, because it's the harmony of the whole that's blend together perfectly, and it, they're also very beautiful. Then you move to the next fruit, is a fix that corresponds to what's called in Hebrew netzach, which means eternity of victory, the ability to overcome obstacles. And they also, when you eat them, they give you stamina. So now we move to pomegranates, one of my favorites. They're such a beautiful, majestic fruit, and it corresponds to what's called hod, which is majesty, or it's also, it also means like glory. So the pomegranates are very, 
are very majestic. They even have a crown, the little tip where, you know, the end of them, they looks like a crown. It can also look like in Magin David, but it's actually, it co heart corresponds to the immune system in the, in the body, according to Rav book. So actually, pomegranate strengthen the immune system. A lot of studies have been done. Pomegranate has become the new elixir in the world because it heals so many things. Uh, and one of them is it's, it has so much antioxidants. If I remember right what I wrote in my book, I have to check. I think it's three times as much as green tea, which is known to have a lot of, of antioxidants. So it helps strengthen the person to get rid of free radicals. So it protects the body from these external invaders. And that's the attribute, the spiritual attribute of hot to be able, like in Hebrew, we say toda, which means thank you. It also means rec to recognize. Because when you thank someone, it's really you recognize that they did something for you. So hot is about recognizing your friends from your foes. And this is uh, why it's connected with the immune system, that you don't want autoimmune illnesses. God forbid, those are the ones where you don't recognize your friends from your foes, where you mix it up. So we move to the next one, which is olives. That's the sixth one. And that, is, uh, that corresponds to your soot, which means foundation. And the, you know, olive oil is the foundation of all Mediterranean cooking. <laughs> so it is... Uh, uh, it's very good. Foundation is connected with all like the reproductive system and actually olive oil is good for the ovaries. It's good for so many things. It has a lot of vitamin E, which is what you need uh, for the re reproductive, for at least the female reproductive system. Now you move to the last one, which is dates. And dates uh, correspond to malchut, which means uh, royalty or kingdom. And it's interesting because it has only one long branch and the leaves comes out of that branch. So it's like the unification, it stands for unification. So when the Jewish people will have one king one day, again, like we had King Solomon, King David, we will be unified under that kingdom. That's what kingdom is about, it's about unifying. And we see also when you make things, uh, if you like to make raw food, which I do, you can use dates to make to bind different substances together. You can also like I'm talking about cakes and cookies, raw. I make all these date bars, and actually the dates are very sticky, so it makes it really good to combine other things together, nuts and coconut and whatnot. And so uh, those are the seven holy fruits of the land of Israel. Those we need to eat and to be shvat. And it's always been a custom. This is written way before the Seder of Tu Bishvat, to eat fruits from the land of Israel. This is why most people, if they don't know much about Tu Bishvat, what they will know is, oh, that's when we eat dried fruit. And why is it dried? Because it's in the winter. And because if you live outside of Israel, in order to get the fruits from Israel, especially in the olden days when they didn't have airplanes, you, need, you could only get it in dried form you know, because it, would, it wouldn't last otherwise. So really, the Tubishva is a time to connect also to the land of Israel, where these fruit grows. And when you eat all of those seven fruits, that makes you more connected to the land of Israel, because they embody that, they, these qualities that are most be imbued and manifested in, in this holy land, in the land of Israel, all of these seven qualities that I just mentioned that correspond to each of those fruits. The book, The Seven Fruits of the Land of Israel, by Rebetzin Chana Bracha Siegelbaum, discusses in great detail the importance of the seven species for which the land of Israel is praised. It describes each unique quality of the species, their medicinal value, and how they can be used in preparation for healthy food suitable for everyone. My book, The Seven Fruits of the Land of Israel, their mystical and medicinal properties. It's been like a work in progress. It's, it's really been a process that's been very long. It started, I would say, maybe close to more than 10 years ago 
when I, as part of my herbal workshop that I teach at Midrashat Beirut Bat Ein, the seminar that I started 18 years ago, as part of that uh, herbal workshop once a week class, in the summer when these fruits ripen, I would teach each week about one of these different fruits. And you know, I prepare the class and I collect material for that and we'll discuss each of the fruits and um, both mystical and medicinal qualities. And I noticed that the medicinal qualities connect with the, with the more spiritual qualities. As I mentioned with the pomegranate, that the immune system is what they're good for and they have antioxidants. And, uh, and that goes together with what the spiritual quality of Hod is, its ability to filter and to strengthen oneself against outside invaders. So I noticed that with all of them, it's like this. And I thought, wow, this is so interesting. And uh, it just, uh, I was writing about it for the class. And then after a while, I uh, decided to make it into a book. Actually, it's only one of the series. If you look at the bottom of the book, it will say it's part of the wholesome nutrition series of the Torah teachings of nutrition and health cookbook. Because I really, I was going to make, and I'm still, I have still, I'm planning to do the other parts. I was going to make a big cookbook, and I saw it was too big of a project. So I decided I'm going to divide it up into sections. I have a challah part, I have a salad part, I have, um, you know, soup part, etc., etc. And I also have a herbology part. I said, you know what, I'm going to start with the fruit part, because my heart is there. Uh, and uh, but I, you know, I hope uh, when I'm ready, I'll start the next one. I'm taking a little breather and just celebrating this book because it really came out really, really gorgeous and beautiful. And uh, our time today, uh, it's become like really the in thing to eat mindfully, to learn about raw food and the vitamins, the vegetables, and all of, you know, it's uh, it's become a really in thing to go back to the more natural way of eating. But truthfully, in the Torah, everything like that, what people are now into, it's we had it for thousands of years already. And in my book, I also bring the Rambam. On each of the seven fruits, I bring something the Rambam has to say about them. So the Rambam, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, or known as the Maimonides, he lived in the 12th, and 12th century, passed away in 1204. And he was uh, one of the most amazing Torah scholars who wrote uh, so many volumes of Torah that the Jewish law is based on t the, what we follow today. In addition to that, he was also the most phenomenal, well-known physician at, of his time to the extent that he became the private physician of the Sultan of Egypt. So the Rambam, he was, all, he, he was all into preventative medicine and holistic medicine. Uh, he was into bo body and mind, um, what do you call it, health for the body and mind, body and soul. And for example, he knew about the importance of if you believe in something, it will work. And he, he knew that if you think something is poisonous, you can even die, someone can die from drinking it, even if it's just sugar. The stories about the Rambam with that. He understood the connection between body and mind, something that's now become the in thing in our time. And he understood that it's important to eat natural. He, he says, you should eat, you should try to heal yourself by the way you eat and the way you sleep and the way you live your life. If that doesn't work, then you can go on to herbs. You, you should, uh, having operations should be the very last resort. And so the things people are coming back to today, we already had it in our Torah. And so my book is reflecting some of these things as I quote the Rambam and I quote many different um, verses in the Torah and chapters of the Talmud, etc., etc. Today, we continue our series with Rabbi Whitmont on the teachings of the Maharal of Prague. In this segment, Rabbi Whitmont focuses on the Maharal's teachings that we should love God and the Torah equally. A 
at the beginning of his Tiferet Yisrael, The Splendor of Israel, which is a book dedicated to the concept, the idea of Torah and mitzvot, the Maral displays what for me is, is almost really emblematic of who he was. He, he asks a very blatant question which bothers many of us. How is it possible that you have outwardly religious people who inwardly are corrupt and eventually end up treating people terribly? How do you have the schism in religious sensibilities and, and, moral, and moral rectitude? How does it develop? And he answers with, with brutal honesty, really profundity. He says as follows, he says that some people end up loving Torah more than they love God, and some people end up loving Torah so much that they end up even hating God for getting in the way of that. And it's, 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 it's startling. He says that you even have great sages who spend their lives connected to all that we see in Judaism, all the parts of Judaism, well, and the, the tremendous depths of this infinite wisdom of Torah, that they love it so much that eventually they disconnect from God and they forget what Torah is there for. And he says it's very simple. What Torah is there for is to enable a relationship of love with God. And he says, and it, and it creates eventually a virtuous cycle. The more a person is in love with God, the more he or she will be able to understand Torah. And the more that he or she is able to understand Torah and learn it, the more he or she will come to love God. But the more he or she comes to love God, the more he or she will be able to understand the profundity of Torah. It creates this incredibly virtuous cycle. On the other hand, if the love is not there, he says, then one doesn't have a virtuous cycle, one has a vicious cycle. And one has people's behavior degenerating literally in ratio to the degree of their separation in emotional and spiritual separation from a relation of love with God. And he says that at, that at the end of the day is where most of the terrible tragedies in Jewish life stem from. That people eventually, or not eventually, initially begin disconnecting from God. And even if they are outwardly performing all of the mitzvot and they look very religious, inwardly it's corrupt. And he says the only two beings who will know whether or not the relationship is sound is of course the person and God. And there is no other way, there's no magic wand that a person can can wave in order to repair a relationship of love and he, and he uses these terminologies which is very reminiscent of the type of terminology we see in Kabbalah really comparing the relationship between human beings and God to the relationship of love between human beings and human beings and uh, he says that at the end of the day a person just has to be brutally honest with themselves and, and ask themselves you know why am I in this am I in it in order to gain wealth? Am I in it in order to gain social standing? Am I in it because I'm just too lazy to do anything else? And um, or on the other hand, am I in it because uh, I really am in love? And he really, he, he deals with this question it's, it's to a certain extent. Bruce and he says, that's the reason that you have these terrible tragedies befalling the Jewish people. And that's why when you look out, you'll find people who really, one can see, are, are disconnected. And of course, this isn't for us to judge other people. It's of course for us to turn inwards and to say to ourselves, you know, how true uh, am I being to myself? And how, how much am I really engaging in my Jewish life merely as a trapping or merely as a cloak? Um, an accessory to my core existence, and how much is this really a part of my inner being? The great Jewish sage, the Maharal of Prague, was a ferocious seeker of the truth. The fact that he was independently wealthy enabled him to speak his mind and engage in topics that others feared to discuss. The other thought that I'd like to share with the Maharal is his attitude towards the democratic interflow of ideas and confrontation. So it's a well-known factor that uh, in many, many places when people in power are threatened with new ideas, that they will often attempt to quash those ideas. In South Africa, we've seen uh, the Secrecy Act, for example, and in other places, we've seen now, of course, in the American administration, the question of how transparent they should be regarding the way that they treat people's rights. 
But there's always this discussion around, you know, perhaps it would be better simply to keep the ideas quiet and not let them threaten the status quo. And the Maral has an incisive response to this. He says, if you attempt to keep the other view, if you attempt to silence the other view, what you're really demonstrating is the weakness of your own view. If you truly believe in the power, integrity, honesty, and truth of what you believe, then you will not be threatened by someone else airing a different view because you will trust enough in the rectitude of your own thoughts and the fact that people and people are able to evaluate things honestly in order to come to the correct conclusions. And he says that really one has to be tremendously careful of this because when one attempts to shut up the other person, what one is doing simultaneously is broadcasting loud and clear to everyone that you really fear another view, that you don't trust in your own view. And when it comes to Torah, the Maharal says, a person who attempts to protect Torah in this way is doing a tremendous disservice because he believes, and he says straight out, the Torah is powerful enough, the truth of the Torah is powerful enough to overcome any opposition. And he trusts it enough to allow other views to be aired and to engage those other views, to confront them head on, in order to demonstrate that the views of Torah, the profundity, the greatness, the beauty, the, the tranquility, the storminess, are all so powerful that they literally sweep away um, any other view, and that the Torah is powerful enough to do that on its own. And that we dare not uh, assume that we need, to, we need to take Torah's part by quashing dissenting views. And this resonates really powerfully with me. These are just two examples of really the, the incredible nature, and the, the incisive way that he writes. And he writes like this. It's really powerful, powerful writing, deep ideas, and an incredible Torah personality. This week's Mishnah from Pirkei Avot comes from chapter 2, verse 12. It quotes Rabbi Yose, who would say, The property of your fellow should be as precious to you as your own. Perfect yourself for the study of Torah for it is not an inheritance to you. And all your deeds should be for the sake of heaven. Sadly, we've come to the end of this week's episode of Simcha. As always, it's been a pleasure to have you join us. If you'd like to be in touch with us, please find us on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions and drop us a line. From myself, Eitan Berger, and the whole team here at Simcha, have a great week and goodbye.